Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. Just how healthy is that salmon on your dinner plate? In this episode, husband and wife reporting team Douglas Franz and Catherine Collins report on the industrialization of the salmon farming industry and the impact that its massive ocean feedlots has on the fish, the ocean and coastal environment, and local economies. Their new book is Salmon Wars, the Dark Underbelly of Our Favorite Fish. Nonfiction authors Douglas France and Catherine Collins are joining us on Q&A this week for their new book, Salmon Wars, The Dark Underbelly of Our Favorite Fish. Douglas France, let me start with you to get a size of this market for salmon. How much salmon is consumed annually in the United States and perhaps globally? Well, globally, it's salmon is formed, farmed salmon forms 70 percent of the salmon eaten globally. It's 90% of the salmon eaten in the United States. Salmon, a few years ago, surpassed tuna as the most popular fish in the American diet. And so it's, it's huge amounts. It's hundreds and hundreds of tons of salmon that are eaten in the United States. Catherine Collins, what was the reason why salmon became so popular? Huh. Well, <laughs> it's a wonderful fish, uh, but as other fisheries have declined, uh, you've seen that salmon has stepped in and filled the void. In the 1990s, there was, for example, the, the, the uh, ban on cod fishing on the East Coast. And uh, with the d- advances in the technology, when people began to explore the possibility of farming salmon on the ocean, it made it possible to produce salmon on an industrial scale. Is, that's really is, what's happened. It's become a big business. It's be, they've industrialized this iconic fish, Susan, and and made it available and made it cheap because it's raised so cheaply in these open net pen farms. Is there something about salmon that makes it more conducive to this sort of farming than other fish, say cod or tuna? Uh, yes, they initially when the cod uh, industry collapsed, they uh, cod fishery collapsed, they did try to farm cod on the ocean and it didn't do well. And uh, salmon, the Atlantic salmon did quite well. You've seen it on the West Coast also. They they don't have much luck farming Pacific Coast salmon, the the five species of the Pacific salmon. Uh, But so that's why they farm Atlantic salmon on the on the Pacific Coast. Is what something Atlantic salmon that that they they take to these cages as better than other fish, which is not to say it's a humane way to treat them. Is wild salmon produced commercially anywhere now? Alaska has a very well managed wild salmon um, campaign uh, market. They, they fish commercially there. It's one of the few places. There's some commercial fishing in Greenland, but that's mostly limited to the indigenous inhabitants there. So most of the wild, wild salmon you find is wild Pacific salmon. And it's, 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 it's a manageable, sustainable industry in Alaska, in part because they have refused to allow any of these open net pen salmon farms in their waters. So if, I, if any shopper were to go into the grocery store today, uh, what kind of labeling do they find to, to understand what kind of salmon they're actually purchasing? Very little labeling in North America. You can't tell whether or not the salmon was, well, you can't see how it was farmed, where it was farmed, who the producer was, uh, what they fed the salmon, how they treated the salmon. Uh, if you go to Europe, however, the Europeans managed to trace their fish from the water to the plate, so you know exactly what you're getting. This is one of the things that we think should be done here. So before we get into more details about salmon farming, a little bit more about you and about the book, uh, this is your seventh collaboration together as authors, but your past books have been on topics like nuclear terrorism and World War II history. How did you get so interested in salmon fishing and salmon farming? Uh, There there are really two answers to this. I'll I'll deal with the first part of it. We um, are not obvious uh, this is not an obvious topic for us. Neither one of us is a fly fisherman. We aren't marine biologists. We're not even environmentalists, although we try to support the right causes. But we think that we are, like our readers, people who care about eating 
uh, in a healthy way and a sustainable and responsible way. So that's that's what made us open to this topic, I think, from the beginning. But we also have uh, a, a tie to it my, that other people might not have. My, my father was an avid fly fisherman. He loved fly fishing the way some people like playing golf. And um, over the years, he stopped fly fishing because he was concerned about the decline in the wild Atlantic salmon population. But I grew up with eating wild Atlantic salmon because he'd come home from fishing trips with all these fish. Our kids have never known that pleasure. And then in the early 90s, when my parents retired, they moved back to Nova Scotia. And dad was really excited because there was a small fish farm, a, a salmon farm off the shore near where they lived. And he thought, here's a chance for us perhaps to take the, the pressure off the uh, population of wild Atlantic salmon, and maybe this will help bring them back. But he discovered pretty quickly afterwards that they had a very bad effect on the environment and the local marine life. And the second part of that answer is that after we moved back to Nova Scotia ourselves, um, in January of 2020, we went to a community meeting in Mahone Bay, Nova Scotia, which is just up the road from us a few miles. And it had been called by an organization, a citizen group called Twin Bays Coalition, because there were plans by two multinational salmon farming companies to locate more than 20 new salmon farms of these open net pen salmon farms along the coast of Nova Scotia, including in some very prime pristine areas. And so we went to this meeting to hear what the issue was about. We had the past connection and experience that Catherine mentioned. And we went there and it was a small community center filled with more than 400 people spilling out into the hallways. There were some experts, but mostly there were everyday people and lobster fishers and others who were concerned about the impact of this on our environment here. And we came away from that meeting having heard a fair amount about the risks and the environmental dangers. And then we did what we've done for all of our other books. We investigated. How do the two of you work together uh, as a team when you approach topics like this? We work very, we, we've <laughs> ironed this out over, over 20, more than 20 years writing books, writing books together. We, Catherine is a, is a far more detailed and experienced researcher than I am, um, but, but we, we try to do that together with Catherine taking the lead. When we sit down at the computer to write, we sit side by side as we're sitting here for this show. and. I have to acknowledge that I often ask for the keyboard. And Catherine's very gracious about it. And then we go through it and she makes everything better as we're sitting here. And then, then we read through it together again. And I, I, we've had very, very few disagreements, correct? Am I right? Yeah, we had a big one once over nuclear weapons trafficking, but nothing over salmon. No. But there, there was an interesting wrinkle in this. Normally, it's really important to meet people face to face in their own environments. And then, but the pandemic began shortly after we started the research. So rather than being able to travel to all these places, we had to do so much research online, so many Zoom meetings. Uh, fortunately, it's a subject that's been well documented by the academics and the scientists and the researchers and the, the various related industries and people who have witnessed this firsthand. So it was a whole different process this time around. It was, but we did get out a few times. We got out to Newfoundland a couple of times, and we went over to New Brunswick to the Atlantic Salmon Federation to see where this whole sort of <laughs> for Canada open net uh, salmon farm started. And so it was it it was great. And but along the way, we met and talked to over Zoom and in person many fascinating characters who really, from our perspective, bring this book to life and, and put a human face. You, you do have extensive source notes in the back of the book, and I'm wondering about uh, anyone that you really wanted to talk to who said no. We, we will not talk about it. The industry. We reached out to the major players in the industry uh, many times by email, by telephone, and every single major company refused to speak with us, which is, was a really a shame, but we tried to make up for that because all these industries have... Um, lots of they have forward-facing information they have their annual reports they have press releases they put out they give interviews to the press and, and they certainly have an active captive press for the aquaculture business 
Um, you do go to litigation, you do SEC filings, you can get quite a bit of information that way. We can. And what we found in their refusal to talk to us, what we eventually figured out is that they want to control their own narrative. They, they, and they have been very successful in controlling the narrative and keeping the kind of information that's in our book, the kind of information discovered by scientists and physicians and other researchers, as well as other journalists. They want to keep that from the public to avoid the stigma of what really happens below the waterline in these salmon farms. Now that your book is out and you've been out talking about it, there's been an excerpt in Time Magazine, have the salmon corporations responded in any way? <laughs> Predictable ways. Um, they, they've used public relations firms to, to put out um, counter information to try and discredit not so much us as, as the information. Uh, for, for instance, the example that struck me the most, one of the aha moments for us in this book when we first began researching it was the discovery on the internet of a photograph taken by some scuba divers beneath a salmon farm, not far, far from us here on Nova Scotia's South Shore. And this, they had gone down and stuck a yardstick 32 inches into this toxic brew of excrement and excess feed and chemical residue beneath the salmon farm. It went into the 32 inch mark. And so we thought, wow, that really says a lot about what's happening here. Well, the industry has suggested that that photograph was taken. They're not quite sure where they think, but it was. they think it was taken below a trout farm. Well, we double checked with the woman who took the photograph and then we double checked with public records and it was taken below a salmon farm just off of Spectacle Island, not far from us. You know, so that's the sort of thing. They try to muddy the water, if you will. They try to discredit um, scientific information with their own often bought and paid for scientific research. So we're going to talk a lot uh, the, uh, for the rest of the hour about some of the concerns that that uh, the side effects of salmon farming that you learned through your investigation. But before we do that, why uh, why was it adopted so broadly? What is the argument in favor of it that countries um, or states in the United States accepted and helped to support salmon farming? There is a worldwide protein crisis, and this industry likes to wrap itself in the mantle of we're here to solve this problem. Um, and when it began, even, you know, salmon farming dates back 3,000 years to the Chinese. And it got a, a, the next big bump with a German scientist in the 1700s, but it didn't really begin to take off as an industri on an industrial scale until Norway undertook building salmon farms. And um, in the just in the last 15, 20 years, they've really scaled up and in this extent that most of these small farms, it used to be a matter of lots and lots of small farms. And now the big multinationals have acquired and consolidated the entire industry. You want to take it? From yeah, I, th I think the reason it's taken off though, Susan, is that People don't understand when they walk into the market or into a rest, sit down at a restaurant table, they don't understand where that salmon they're eating came from. Right. They just have this Im image of it being raised in the pristine ocean and swimming wildly up streams and stuff because that's part of what the industry is trying to sell, this image. But it's just an image. It's not a sustainably raised fish. It's not raised naturally. It's filled with chemicals and antibiotics. But people just don't know that. And as a result, it's become a hugely popular fish in middle income and upper income countries, not so much in the low income income countries, which are getting the short end of the stick in this, in this equation. So you spend a lot of time in the book talking about uh, Norway and Canada, and I do want to learn more about the industries in those two countries. But before, in a general sense, um, can we go through some of the mechanics of salmon farming? Where are the nets typically placed? How big are they? And walk us through some of the uh, issues that arise from this kind of farming. Well. Imagine a feedlot, a floating feedlot, on, and they're often anchored in protective, uh, protected cove, coves, fragile coves, often on the migration route for wild salmon, because what's good for wild salmon is, is good for these farm salmon. Um, each farm consists usually of maybe 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 12 um, 
cages. They can be square, they can be round, but the, and they're interconnected with a series of walkways. Um, they're anchored to the seabed with long cables, so it, which actually extends the, the amount of room they occupy. And each cage holds up to 100,000 fish. So a farm itself can contain a million or more fish. Um, these salmon are, are hatched on land and freshwater, but raised to maturity to market size, as they like to say, on the salt water. And they spend more than two years crammed into these cages, swimming in circles. It was PETA that, that tried to do an analysis of the size and, and how crammed these cages. And they decided that to, working at the volume of a cage and the size of a mature salmon, that it was like cramming 27 full-size salmon into your bathtub. That's the extent to which they're crowded in, into these cages. And the crowding leads to inevitable, inevitable problems. They become petri dishes for parasites and pathogens. If you think back on our continuing COVID experience, we know that going into a crowded room is far more dangerous than being outdoors when it comes to catching this virus. And it's the same in a salmon pen. These pens are very crammed with fish as Catherine described, but they, and because of that proximity, the parasites find many, many willing hosts and it's easy to spread diseases. If those diseases stayed simply within the salmon farm, that would be bad enough, but they also spread through the water column to wild salmon as they're passing by the cages. So they, they suffer from diseases, the parasites, sites, which we can talk about in a little bit later in, in gruesome detail, um, are particularly lethal for small salmon beginning their migration from fresh rivers to the ocean when they must pass these salmon farms. So uh, let me go back to the <clears throat> layer that you were describing, the 36 inches of layering on the, on the ocean floor beneath these pens, uh, excrement and f f undigested food, etc. What's the impact on the ocean floor of that? Well, <clears throat> there have been a numerous scientific studies um, showing that this, and, and anecdotal evidence, I must say, showing that this, this residue, sometimes it accumulates below the pens and it smothers all of the oxygen, takes all of the oxygen away from marine life there and you have a complete dead zone under the, under the pen. More often, I think, what happens is the currents of the ocean will come in and sweep this through the water column and spread it for hundreds of yards around the salmon farms. And these salmon farms are huge. That from that from the surface, they look you know they look gross and and gruesome, but not huge. But they cover up to 50 acres. A single salmon farm will cover up to 50 acres, and that means that this this residue, this toxic stew, is spread beneath these 50 acres, and then it spreads beyond into the water column and it drives away lobsters, it drives away all shellfish, it kills the eel grass, it disrupts the ecosystem of the oceans. And that really is the biggest environmental danger from these farms. It disrupts the ecosystem of the oceans. And, and we see that in, in study after study. One other aspect of this that you write about in the book is the fish food, uh, salmon being ca carnivores. Uh, and you write in it that there's 1.5 pounds of fish food to harvest every pound of salmon. So what is the impact of that? I think one of the most important impacts is that it used to be three to one and they have reduced it. And they've tried various methods for reducing the, the fish meal and fish oil required by, to feed salmon. Uh, they've tried using vegetable products and that sort of thing, but but salmon are, are carnivores from the very early stages of their lives when they eat insects and 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 then of course when they migrate to the ocean. But um, these uh, on the west coast, the obvious impact is on the west coast of Africa, where the various fishing companies go and scoop up these these small pelagic forage fish from the ocean by the tons. They, they take them right out of that system where, where there's part of the sustenance fishery that goes to feed people, you know, goes to their straight to their, to their markets and their dinner tables. So what you're doing is you're taking fish that we would be used to feed human beings on, in Africa to feed our fish 
that we can buy it wherever and and eat in restaurants in North America. And it's it's not just. And and for, for half of these fisheries off the west coast of Africa are on the verge of collapse. And some it's 40% of those people doing the the companies doing the fishing there are operating illegally. The uh, Greenpeace and the UN have both warned about the situation as, as being quite dire at this point. How are global uh, regulatory bodies responding to this? Is anyone overseeing this that has any regulatory authority against these companies? No, not 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 in a material way. The EU has tried to cut down on some of the on the illegal fishing by trawlers from EU countries. But that's only a drop in the ocean, to use a phrase, when it's when you look at the Chinese and other Asian trawlers that come in there. The Chinese trawlers have these huge nets off the that they use off the coast of Africa, and they, they will they would literally sweep up a jumbo jet. They're that big. So they take hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fish in a single scoop and they process them and they, they sell them for fish meal and fish oil that goes into the San aquaculture food and pet food as well. And it, it does, we, we talked to a, a Greenpeace expert on, on African oceans and he said that you're taking food off the tables and out of the mouths of poor people to feed people in the United States and Europe and other wealthy countries. And that, that happens and, and as Catherine said, the ratio of fish, forage fish, these are herring and sardines and anchovies and menhaden. The ratio has gone down within the salmon farm aquaculture industry, but it's gone down not because they're trying to do the right thing, but it's gone down because it's become much more expensive because the demand for these forage fish has increased dramatically as the salmon production from these farms has increased globally. It's become a $20 billion business globally operated and controlled by 10 or so oligarchies that are big multinational oligarchies. And, and they respond to the market, but they don't necessarily respond to the environmental concerns associated with their business. You also report that it is a pretty profitable business with margins as high as 50%. Yes, that's right, and, and that's the here's an interesting example. Even in the first the first quarter of this year of 2022, the four largest Norwegian salmon farming companies, which are controlled by family shareholders basically, um, made $2.2 billion between the four of them in one quarter, in one quarter and a quarter where salmon prices were down because COVID and people not going to restaurants had reduced the demand a little bit. You know, it is it is a, a profit driven business and we believe that that profits should not be the only reason for a business to exist. And that there is an interesting element to this. These, these companies that place these farms on the ocean, they're freeloading. They don't have, if you do it on land, you have to buy your land, you have to build your building, you have to acquire your water and provide your energy on the ocean they're freeloading out there. Some countries will charge some some amounts. Norway will charge for leases at a considerable amount, but here they're pretty cheap leases and they get free use of the water. Their energy requirements are, are minimal and uh, they're, they're taking part or they're using an asset that one might argue belongs to all of us, to the taxpayer and to citizens. Well, let's talk more about how Norway got so uh, invested in this. In your writing about Norway, we meet a character by the name of John Fredrickson. What's his story? It's very interesting. John Fredrickson at one point was Norway's richest man, but he instead moved his citizenship to Cyprus to avoid the uh, high taxes that he felt he was paying in Norway, but he remains living, lives in Norway. He, he and he, is, he got his start in business by purchasing oil tankers, and he he won at he he owned and may still own the largest fleet of oil tankers in the world during the Iran Iraq War in the 1980s. He used his huge fleet of oil tankers to take Iranian oil to the market. He was the only person who was doing that. And in 2006, he came in. To, he took a look at the salmon farming industry, and he saw an opportunity there 
for merging smaller medium size and medium sized companies into one large company to create the kind of near monopoly that he had in oil transport and so he bought he started buying up companies by in, in large number he created a company a holding company called marine harvest which was later turned into maui when maui is the largest salmon farming company in the world it's based in bergen bergen norway but most interestingly as as fredrickson was doing this he attracts attention as as a very wealthy billionaire who who had some scrapes with the norwegian authorities in 2007 he was salmon fishing on the alta river in norway which is one of the few norwegian rivers that still has a good salmon run and you pay up to ten thousand dollars a day to go fish on that river and he'd flown in on a private helicopter with a bunch of his buddies and a reporter caught him at the airport on their way out and asked him about the problem of his salmon farms being next to salmon runs and the migration route. And he said, I agree, we, we need to think about getting these farms away from the migration routes so they don't harm wild salmon. And the, the salmon, the, 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 the wild salmon proponents went really crazy about that. They thought it was the best thing they'd ever heard because here was this wealthy guy who was dominating the industry, willing to move these open net pens away from the migration routes where they were doing damage to wild salmon already in great decline. And so he got a lot of letters, he got a lot of support and, you know, like lots of things that happen from the corporate side in the business world, he didn't do anything. Maui just continued to grow and grow and grow. And they moved their operations from Norway, where there are some restrictions that don't exist in other countries. They moved them to places where, where the attitude of governments is far more lax, places like Chile and Canada and the West Coast and East Coast of Canada, and, and to, as well as to Scotland. You know, they, they, they moved um, where they could operate the easiest and where they could externalize all their costs onto society and and also through their 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 propaganda campaigns avoid the stigma of of what they're doing beneath the water so it might be obvious from the answer that you just gave but in the book you uh catherine collins you write that frederickson's efforts at industry consolidation change everything about the salmon farming business can you detail that a little bit more about how big the impact was on the industry overhaul, all, overall of consolidation. Um, you want to do it? No, go ahead. No, you do it. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. That's that was we we did divide it as I said we did divide this research a little bit and I I focused on that pretty hard. Um, what happened was before then you had as sort of medium sized small to medium sized salmon farms. Um, and they weren't quite mom and pop operations anymore, but they certainly weren't these global giants that they have become. But what what Fredrickson did was combine them into this giant company called Maui. And in order to compete, other salmon farmers and salmon industry titans had to grow as well. And so you went from this this these smaller operations, which which had less impact on the environment, which raised salmon at a much lower density to these high and in super intensive floating feedlots that now, like all, like so many businesses, bigger is better here. The more fish you can cram into a cage, the more profit you're gonna make. Even, even when that cramming results in mortality rates for salmon of 15 to 20% globally, and as much as 50% in some locations. You know, so that's how profitable they are. And Fredrickson sort of opened the door for the industrialization of this iconic fish. You uh, report that, that salmon farming became at, in Norway after oil, the country's second largest export. Is that still true today? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. Even, yes. even yes. with their increased regulations, it's still their second largest business. Yes. It's, it's huge. and. It's it's an inter one of the interesting little tidbits we learned is that it was in, that we had some warning that this was going to happen in the early 90s. A Norwegian parliamentarian visited Canada and was providing some testimony or information to one of the relevant agencies here, and he did say that Norway was going to begin tight, raising the the costs of their leases and tightening their reg regulations. 
And he did say at that time that their companies were going to start looking abroad for uh, less expensive places to do business and places where the regulations wouldn't be as onerous. And that's in fact what happened. So let's talk more about Canada, because in 1979, as the cod fishing industry was collapsing, you write that Canada sent a team of marine biologists to Norway to learn about salmon farming. So uh, how did that, that then unroll in Canada that they, uh, the, the country adopted the, the process and wanted to encourage and support salmon farming? Um, it, well, initially it started with a series of very small farms, as Doug was saying. I think Newfoundland had 80 of them at one point uh, before the collapse of the cod industry in uh, the early 90s. But, um, and the same thing was true in the Bay of Fundy. They had dozens and dozens of small farms, which were eventually bought out by Glenn Cook. Uh, there were not as many here, but we had some Cook uh, facilities here in Nova Scotia. But the big companies have, within the last 10, 15 years, taken over all the small farms. To back up just a little bit, the, it, it, like Kathy's father, the, the scientists in the in the 80s and in the in the late 70s and early to mid 80s <laughs> thought that with the cod fishery going away and wild salmon in in decline, that they could use these salmon farms, this technique that had been developed in Norway to grow commercial salmon in the waters of Canada and provide a source of jobs for people. And so the Canadian government subsidized research into this and then they subsidized the farms starting in the late 1980s. And that's when here in Canada, an entrepreneur, um, small town entrepreneur from New Brunswick um, began accumulating and eventually emulating John Fredrickson from Norway by buying out all of those other small farms to create what is now Cook Aquaculture, the largest independent salmon farming company in the world. You know, so the government thought they had a good idea here and they, they, they subsidized the introduction of this. Now that we can see the environmental consequences on this, the government has got so much money in the pot and they, they, these, in, these farms do provide some low-level jobs that the government doesn't, is not unwilling to back away. And we see in some Canadian provinces, in fact, that they're doubling down and increasing the number of these salmon farms. Where is it prevalent in the United States? It's, it's pretty limited in the United States right now. Um, Maine, there are about 24 to 26 open net salmon pens along the along the coast of Maine and there were a fair number off the coast of Washington state in Puget Sound but in 19 in, in 2017 there was a major collapse of a salmon farm in Puget Sound which dumped about 250,000 alien Atlantic salmon into the waters of, of, that are home to Pacific salmon and this salmon farm collapsed, Washington State investigators later determined, because of negligence in the way it was operated. And so there was a public outcry that led Washington State to ban open net salmon pens in their waters. And so now what you have is up and down the West Coast, Alaska banned these farms 30 years ago, 35 years ago maybe, Oregon and California don't allow them and Washington joined that crew. So you really only have them in Maine now and, and they've become very defensive in Maine. Some of, the, some of the sharpest criticism of our book has come from the head of the Maine Aquaculture um, Association. Well, we've been talking about it a lot, and, I, and I'm going to show a clip just so that people that are watching this can get a sense of the visuals of this, uh, because there have been a few documentaries done on salmon farming. This one is in 2019, a documentary called Artificial, and the person we'll see on the screen is journalist Mikhail Froden. Let's watch. It's about 50 seconds. I really always wanted to see, see one of these farms. got into our wetsuits, then we jumped into the sea, and we sneaked up to one of these farms. I 
I knew I, I was going to see a lot of fish, but I didn't think it was going to be that bad. It was so full of sick fish. They had fungus, they looked like S's. They were wounds big as my hand. So if, in fact, the pens uh, make the fish susceptible to viruses and other issues, how do they prevent that from getting to market for consumers? Uh, most of the, of the, <laughs> here's how they get the parasites off of the fish. Those, those parasites called sea lice, they're about the size of your fing little fingernail, and they attach themselves to the salmon with very tiny little but, but determined jaws, and they eat the mucus and the blood and the fins of the salmon, and they cause the wounds that, that, that the narrator was just describing, and those wounds eventually can become fatal when you have a major sea infestation. You, you, they lose tens of thousands of fish, sometimes more, in a single cage. They have to purge all the fish in that cage sometimes to stop the infestation. How do they stop them, the salmon from getting to the market with those parasites? One of the a fish processing plant worker we interviewed in Newfoundland said that when the fish come in from the salmon net pens there, they use a shop vac to, shop, to, to sweep off the parasites before they throw the fish onto the conveyor belt, belt for processing. And she said that they're stressing the idea within the processing uh, the process of, of salvaging fish even when, even when they're damaged. As far as the disease, most of the diseases that affect and damage um, salmon, infectious salmon, anemia, which spreads widely in, in farm salmon, and another one called PRV, piscine orthovirus. Um, they, don't, they don't cause harm to humans, but what they do is, is kill these fish in, in huge numbers. May I, may I add one thing? The industry likes to defend itself against the, the concerns about sea lice, saying that they exist in the wild anyway. And that's true, they do. Um, you talk to salmon ang to anglers, and they will tell you that occasionally they find a little uh, insect on one of their fish and you can flick it off with a fingernail. What you don't find in the in a fish outside a fish farm swimming in the wild is five, six, seven hundred sea lice on a single fish that has to be removed in this way. We have about 20 minutes left in our conversation. So if this became really popular in the 1980s forward, how long after commercial, big commercial farms became popular did the problems become apparent? It's a great question. There was a study in 2004 by um, scientists from Indiana University and Cornell University, as well as some outside experts, and they purchased farmed Atlantic salmon at various places, wholesale outlets and, and retail outlets in Europe and the United States, and then they, did, they analyzed the content of these fish. And what they found was, for instance, Farmed Atlantic salmon had seven times the PCBs that wild salmon have, and PCBs are a well-known well known, uh, carcinogen. They also found other contaminants and toxins. So going back at least to 2004, these problems have been evident. Now, there has been some evolution within the industry. They've tried to deal with some of these problems and they, you know, to some positive effect, but not enough because what's happened is since 2004, this industry has grown dramatically and it's grown dramatically by raising more fish in more crowded conditions, by invading more salmon migration routes and bringing more dis dis destruction to the endangered wild salmon. You know, so so we've known about this problem. The industry has has basically tried to greenwash it. They they claim that they're raising su a sustainable fish in a natural way. Well, there's nothing natural about condemning an adult salmon to two to three years in a cage. And it's really interesting. The study that Doug cited in Science Magazine, um, it was peer reviewed. There was a it was a, a legitimate peer reviewed scientific report. And the industry fought back, and they they in fighting back they accuse the researchers and the funders of the research of having a pro pollution agenda, an anti pollution. I'm sorry, an anti pollution agenda. 
I mean, who on earth has a pro-pollution agenda? This is just part of the strategy of attacking the, the messenger and trying to rewrite or control the narrative in a way that, that supports their bottom line. In addition to research, scientific research, uh, that has also fostered uh, activists around the globe who have uh, tried to raise some of the concerns uh, about salmon farming. <clears throat> One of the individuals that you write about is a woman by the name of Alexandra Morton. You call her the Jane Goodall of salmon. What's her story? Oh, Alex has a wonderful story and she's, she's just an impassioned marine biologist who has made this who has made protecting wild salmon and trying to get these open net salmon pens out of the water her life her life's work her story be, began in in a in a in a tragic way really she had, she had gotten she's an american she moved up to british columbia and was was um, looking to do some research on orca whales there killer whales and she met a diver who was a filmmaker and a scuba diver an underwater filmmaker and they met and within a few months they were married and soon after that they had a child and one one day they were out in their zodiac a, a rub, big large rubber boat um, and he was down below and he was filming orca whales and alex and their, her son their young son were in the boat and and he had always told her never go down and disturb the shot you know don't bother me when i'm under there and unfortunately he was using a rebreather instead of a regular scuba tank which creates bubbles rebreathers recirculate the oxygen so that they don't create bubbles because the bubbles upset the orca whales and he didn't come up and he didn't come up and finally alex tied a rope to herself and went down in the water and she found her husband dead and his camera had rolled to the bottom he had he'd suffered carbon monoxide poison and now a lot of people raising a single being coming a single parent and raising a son like that would have moved away and would have found something easier to do but she has remained committed to it she has done scientific studies participated in them that have I, that have focused on clear problems with these nets in British Columbia. She's done a lot of legal work. She was behind a law, a, a court case in British Columbia, where the British Columbia Supreme Court ruled that the, the provincial government was not doing a good enough job regulating the aquaculture industry, particularly the open net salmon pens. And so they transferred that that authority to the federal government which has done a slightly better job and the crux of that legal decision was interesting because <laughs> you they call these salmon farms but they're not farms they're on the water and they're fisheries and the british columbia court determined that these are fisheries and therefore under control of the federal government rather than farms which would have left them under control of the provincial government so we have about 15 minutes left in our conversation. As you've described the problems that are created by the salmon farming global industry, what do you want to happen as a result of your work and raising awareness? Is it possible to make salmon farming safer for either the, the fish and for the public? Or are you thinking that it's an industry that needs to be over time eradicated? Well, there are there's a fascinating new development and, and we're quite hopeful about it. It's called RAS and RAS stands for recirculating aquaculture system. And there are two really interesting examples in existence in the States right now. Although we were looking at the numbers last week to see how it's going around their world. And it sounds like there are maybe a hundred or more projects underway at this moment that we, that people hope will come to market pretty soon. But in the States, what, what these things do, it's a whole new way of farming fish. And instead of placing a salmon farm on the water in public space, they, they build these farms on land, often far from the water and closer to markets. And the, the fish are raised in a completely controlled environment and their waste is, is, is removed and reused immediately. The water is treated because the fish are never in the ocean. They don't have to be fed antibiotics or anything to treat the possible infections. Um, it's, it's just fascinating. And the one the, the one in uh, Florida is probably the biggest in the world, Atlantic Sapphire, and they have what they call blue house fish. And one of, that's really interesting also 
because it's completely different from anything else anywhere, it seems, is Superior Fresh in, Wisconsin, in landlocked Wisconsin, where they've managed to raise their fish in fresh water only. And because they can do this, this opens up the possibility of reusing that water, the fresh water, without any salt in it, in a connected hydroponics facility. So they're able to simultaneously raise salmon in one place and leafy greens on another while reusing the waste that's produced and, and not wasting any water at all. Superior Fresh has a video on its website about their processes and we, we pulled a, a brief clip from that just to show people how that works. Uh, Superior Fresh is the first indoor Atlantic salmon farm in the United States and we utilize the nutrient rich water from those Atlantic salmon to grow fresh local organic leafy greens right here in Wisconsin. The facility's intense. Um, so we can produce about 160,000 pounds a year of Atlantic salmon and steelhead. We incubate the eggs for uh, a short period of time, a couple weeks. Then they go into a, a fry tank or first feeding tank where we feed train these, these very small fish. They look like little minnows. And then they go through a smaltification process. Uh, Atlantic salmon are anadromous, so they typically go from freshwater to saltwater. Uh, we only use freshwater in our systems. So after they go through that, that uh, smaltification process, they go into a, a post-smalt system. And then after post-smalt, they go into a growth system for one year. So from egg to harvest is about two years. Two years for that, which is about equivalent for what you said earlier it takes for the farm on, on the ocean pens. So, but the difference, uh, Doug Francis, you were talking about the economics of this business, as, as was Catherine. The, this, it requires land, it requires capital intense to build these facilities, as opposed to putting pens on free ocean water. So where's the incentive going to be for the industry to move to more expensive means of farming salmon? Well, the incentive has to come from consumers, Susan. Um, they they people have to understand they have to be educated which is what we're trying to do with this book that they're eating fresh what's called fresh atlantic salmon and that's often the only thing you see on the label it doesn't even say farmed and this fresh atlantic salmon they're they're eating comes at a much higher cost than they're having to pay because of the ability of the salmon farming industry to externalize the costs push them on onto society and so these this if farm land-based salmon is costing more right now, but this is a new and disruptive technology. So we're hoping that they'll solve the technical problems and they're beginning to make some real progress that we have two, two very successful land-based salmon farms here in Nova Scotia. Um, and they're beginning to solve those. The prices are beginning to come down um, and they will eventually re become, be get close to parity with the farm raised with the open net uh, pen salmons, but 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 what we really have to do is people have to understand it, and people have to make a decision when they eat. They have to you have to make a decision that that eat, eat you're going to eat in a way that aligns with your values, with the climate crisis that we're facing, and with the social issue of social justice, which we brought up earlier about about taking food out of the mouths of low income people you know so you have this requires a drive on the part of consumers when you go to the seafood counter or when you sit down at a restaurant ask where that salmon came from was it farmed on the ocean or did it come from a land based from a land based facility if it's from a land based facility it's safer for the environment and it's safer for your health because they don't have any of this residue from chemicals from pesticides from antibiotics in there you know so so this really comes down to making smart informed choices as an individual and you know the environmental defense fund did a study very recently and i think it shows that consumers are ready for this the, the numbers were really clear. It was almost 70% of those surveyed said they were concerned about the origin of their seafood. More than 70% said they would eat more seafood if consumer protections were strengthened. And 70% said they'd eat more seafood if the environmental standards for fish farms were raised and that the fish, that they could know that the fish were coming from sustainable sources. The, in, remember Adam Smith, who was the, who's considered the father of modern capitalism, he, he said years ago that 
consumers need good information about what they buy and sell in order to make do good decisions. And he recognized that if consumers are fed a steady diet of misinformation, which is what has been happening over the decades from the, from the industry itself, greenwashing, if you will, the market will not function smoothly. So I just, we just think that we need to channel a little more Adam Smith these days. <laughs> But for so many people, uh, that is a luxury to be informed better about what they're consuming. It's really all about what they can afford. So uh, let me ask the question again about whether or not there is something that can be done, not just to lower the price of, of land-based salmon farming, but to make these fish farms that you've explored so much less toxic. I'm, I, I, I don't think Catherine and I, after, after more than two years of research and after talking, to hundreds of people. I, I, I don't think we believe that open net salmon pens on the ocean will ever be safe and will for for the environment and and for the wild for wild salmon, among other things. They're they're unholy messes and they need to be reformed and rather ruthlessly reformed. And what that means, I think, in the end, is those nets have to come out of the water. We have to move to land. And for people who don't want to pay the higher prices, and we certainly understand that, and looking at inflation right now, that's, that's a more serious concern than it's been for a long time in the United States and, and in Canada. If you face that, buy a cheaper fish, buy, eat your fish that's lower down on the trophic level, look, at, look for well-raised tilapia, eat smaller fish, eat mackerel, eat sardines, eat anchovies, you know, get your fatty acid, fat, your omega-3 fatty acids and other proteins that you need, that you need from lower down on the fish, on the, the fish chain and don't eat carnivores, which are, which are raised only by eating other small fish. That's, I mean, it's a hard pill to swallow, if you will, but, but we need to change our dietary habits and we need some help to do this from the government. I mean, the government in the United States has a pretty sad record when it comes to regulating salmon. As we said, 90% of the salmon eaten in the United States now is farm salmon that is imported from other countries. A few years ago, the General Accounting Office did a, did a pretty thorough investigation of how the Food and Drug Administration handles imported food, uh, seafood. And what they found when it came to imported salmon was that, they, they, that in 2017, the FDA inspected 86 samples of salmon, of imported salmon out of 379,000 tons of imported salmon. I mean, it's it's not even a fraction. It's not even a fraction. And what happens, they don't import that. So they, they're not looking at how many pesticides we're using. They're not looking at whether illegal chemicals were used in the raising of this. And ultimately, they're not protecting the American consumer. Let me go back to governments have to be part of the solution. You, you said earlier, uh, Douglas, that the Canadian government is so very invested in salmon farming. Uh, in fact, one thing we didn't talk about is when there are these uh, big kills or die-offs of salmon, the government actually subsidizes salmon farmers for their losses. So what's it going to take for governments that have made such a big investment in this industry to change their direction? Oh, that's, that's, that's a great question. And, and what we compare in the book, we compare with what, what happened in Washington state when they had this single farm collapse in Puget Sound and the reaction there, there was the, the citizen uprising, if you will, and the, the legislature passing legislation, Governor Inslee signing it into law, banning open net salmon pens in, in Washington waters. We look at that and then we look at what happened here far on the Atlantic coast of Canada in Newfoundland at two years later when there was a die off of 2.6 million salmon in a single episode, 2.6 million salmon in a single episode from warming waters, from parasites, and from chemical treatments, a combination of those things. Instead of taking strict actions and regulating this and restricting this, the Newfoundland government doubled down and they invited 
the salmon farms that were being pushed out of Washington state and, and those facing being pushed out up the coast from British Columbia, he invited them to come there, bring your operations here. And just a few weeks ago, the government of, Nova, of Newfoundland opened up another 100 kilometers of its coastline to salmon farming. You know, so they have doubled down. Newfoundland is different from Washington State. We understand that. The economics are different. Newfoundland is, is a remote place where jobs are hard to come by. But they're destroying the environment. They're destroying the lobster fisheries, the herring fisheries, the scallop fisheries there. And it's a typical of a short-sighted government plan. So as we wrap up here, last couple of minutes, and based on that story and also your example of Norway implementing regulations and the industry just moving elsewhere, where do you see this all going over the next five to 10 years? I think, in the, I think there's a good possibility that in the next 10 years, land-based recirculating aqua, aqua, aquaculture systems will become a big part of the market. They won't dominate the market quite yet then, but I think within 10 years, the projections from economists, and perhaps they're optimistic, but the projections are that they'll have 25 to 30 to 40% of the market. Atlantic Sapphire, the operation in Florida that Catherine mentioned earlier, um, itself plans to have produce enough salmon to take over 20% of the US market. And there's a great advantage here, it's healthier fish, but it's also fish that can be raised closer to the retail outlets, closer to where you live. So we don't have the carbon footprint of flying fish over from Norway and Scotland and up from Chile. And so th this is a win-win situation. So as we close here, how did the work on this book impact the two of you personally? Huh. Well, we only eat land-based salmon. We eat it at all. You know, I'll tell, I'll tell you, I mean, we, we have been both been journalists for many, many years. Um, and, and we have, we have tried to be as journalists should be objective and fair minded. Then you go out and go gather the facts and you come to conclusions and the conclusions that we've come to here about the risks involved with salmon that's raised in these open net pens is that the risks are greater than we ever could have imagined. We used to be the same people who went into Costco and other places and bought fresh Atlantic salmon without knowing a darn thing. What we're trying to do here is share our experience and share a bit of our outrage with consumers and with potential readers of this book because it has changed our outlook on salmon and it, and it has renewed our commitment to trying to eat responsibly in every way. The book is called Salmon Wars, The Dark Underbelly of Our Favorite Fish. Douglas France, Catherine Collins, thanks so much for spending an hour with C-SPAN to tell us what you've learned in your research and, and the writing of your book. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. <laughs>